I said verses 32 through 33 is based out of Isaiah 53 verses 7 through 8. This is the prophecy of Jesus. And Jesus is suffering. Jesus is going to suffer at the cross of death. It's going to be injustice. And Philip is going over this of who Jesus Christ is. Philip has the opportunity to lead him to Jesus Christ, into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the third aspect of God using misfits to tell, to communicate his story. Number one, yes, misfits are wired differently. Number two, you engage in the story. Number three, you tell Jesus' story. You tell Jesus' story. Now, if I throw out this word to you, evangelism, some of you all may think positive. Some of you all may think negative. Some of you all may think, okay, I think of, um, I think of witnessing. I think of passing out a track. I think of talking to someone about Jesus. Negative connotation, you may think of turn and burn. You might think of the guy on the street corner who has a bull horn that says you're all going to burn in hell. You may think of fire and brimstone. Did you know that according to Barna statistics, that 30% of people who come to a service is only invited by a church leadership staff, but 70% will come to a church service with someone they knew who invited them? But here's the interesting thing, though. Do you know that many, many followers of Christ, many of us believe and feel that our faith is a personal matter, meaning we don't need to share it with anybody. We're going to keep it to ourselves, and this is not true. There's a pastor I heard a couple of years ago, and I forget the guy's name, but he said, pleading the fifth is not an option when it comes to our hope. Pleading the fifth it's not an option when it comes to our hope. Now, I heard this a couple years ago that in our metro area, Kanawha and Putnam County, there was a statistic that was done. That 30% of people in the metro area, 30% were saying that they were spiritual. And that category falls as whether you're Christian, whether you're a Wicca, whether you're Catholic, Muslim, Buddha, whatever else. 30% in the metro area, Kanawha County, Putnam County. So that means 70 plus people in our own backyard in the United States of America, in West Virginia, in the Bible Belt, in Kanawha County, in Putnam County, in y'all's backyards, there are people who have never heard of nor have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So here are some things that we get to learn from Philip when it comes to telling about Jesus' story. Number one, being obedient to God creates opportunities. Folks, we have opportunities every single day. You are your own missionary, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your office, whether it's in your job, the spheres of influence that you have, your family and friends. You have opportunities. You have an opportunity when you pump gas to actually go in and have a conversation with the clerk or actually do the credit card because you've got to go somewhere else. I guarantee you five minutes can make a difference depending on how you interact with the clerk at the counter at 7-Eleven. Number two. Be led by the Spirit of God. You look at verses 29. Notice how Philip didn't say, oh, but I'm praying for boldness. No, see, that's the thing. When we're led by the Spirit of God, we will get boldness when it comes to that particular situation. Number three, ask questions that focus on the person's need. When you look at verses 30 through 35. The eunuch is constantly asking Philip questions that deal with what his need. I don't understand this. Do you know this? Is this about this person? Is this about Jesus? I don't know. So you want to direct, ask questions that focus on a person's need. Lastly of this, point people to the word of God and not yourself. Verses 32 through 33. I'm not saying it's not wrong to give your testimony, but if I'm going to go on and on for 20, 30 minutes telling about me, 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 and my opinions and my thoughts... And I completely, completely took away the point and the glory of God. It's got to go back to the word of God. So, he's giving him the gospel. He comes into relationship with Jesus Christ. He sees some water. And we pick up in verse 38. He says, so he commanded the chariot to stand still. So that tells me that 
at least one other person was with him if he's commanding the chariot to stand still. So publicly, there's somebody else with him. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now, just a side note here. Baptism means immersion, that we're going into the water. Verse 39, now that when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Asotos, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So after the Ethiopian gave his life to Jesus Christ, he wants to be pulled over. And let me just say for a side note here, Philip was an apostle. He was an everyday regular guy that baptized another everyday regular guy. So he pulled over and he baptizes him. He's filled with the Spirit. He's filled with joy. Philip goes to one direction while the eunuch goes back home. Now, I want to come back to the eunuch. Remember, the eunuch traveled over 200-something miles, a 10-month round trip, to, to go to worship in Jerusalem. Now, something tells me that he wasn't satisfied. He went all this way to worship. He's not satisfied when he goes to Jerusalem to worship. But then on the way home, he's reading in essence, he's reading the word of God. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah, but yet he's still not satisfied. The eunuch actually reminds me a lot of people in our culture. Religious people. You guys know them. We have them in our culture. Sometimes we have them in our church. Sometimes we know people. The religious people are people who like to do the checkoff list. I want to come to church. They, they seek out various truths from various things. Or they might go down the to-do list, this, 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 and this, this. But they have no saving faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And that was the eunuch until he understood that he had to have a relationship with Christ for his sins to be forgiven. Misfits. Misfits know that religion doesn't save you. Jesus does. And let me just take a side note for anybody who is watching this, listening to this, you hear tonight, and you don't know the Lord. Let me just say this. You may be in the same predicament, the same boat as a eunuch. Maybe you're doing this whole religion. Religion is a man-made substance. Christianity is about the life, death, and the resurrection. It's a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, that he literally came down on a rescue mission to save us from condemnation, to save us from hell, to save us from our own sins, so that we would have eternal life. It was washed, it was done with at the cross, but it's not more just an intellect, it's what we're gonna do about knowing that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he is the Messiah. If you wanna to talk to me afterwards more about what a relationship with Jesus Christ looks like, I would be more than happy to. John Wesley. John Wesley was a very religious man. Matter of fact, I just got done reading a book like on his bio and so forth. But most people didn't realize this. John Wesley, if you don't know, he is the one that kind of created the um, denomination of Methodist because he had different methods of preaching the gospel and how to reach the people who didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But in the very beginning, early stages of his life, Wesley kind of questioned his assurance of his salvation. Yet he's going out and telling people about Jesus Christ and preaching the gospel, but yet this man has questionable assurance for himself. I want to read you his journal. On May 24th, 1738, he's in London. He's in a small group. And he overhears someone reading a commentary by Martin Luther out of Romans. And this is, this is the description that changed and transformed his heart. He says, about a quarter before nine, while we was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ. Christ alone for salvation and assurance was given me that had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And the result of Wesley's transformation turned into the Wesley Revival of Britain. Now, I ask you this. We're talking about telling Jesus' story. 
The question is, are you seeking religion or Jesus? And let me help you break it down for you. Religion is rules and regulations. Jesus is relationship. Traditions or heaven bound. Held captive or set free. Seeking satisfaction or satisfied. Death or life. God works or good works or work that has already been done. Man says, God says. Fear or peace. So we come down to the very last essential that we see in verses 38 through, 30, 38 through 40. They're baptized, they come out of the water. Here's the first, fourth one, is to live the story. Live the story. Misfits live the story by continuing to do the work of the Lord. Misfits are joy-filled regardless. If you notice that the eunuch when he comes out out of the water, he's joy-filled, even though the guy who just left the Lord is already taken away. Church history tells us that the church, the body of Christ, grew in southern Egypt. And then we look at Philip. And if you look at Philip, it's interesting. In verses 40, it says, But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea, Azotus. This is about 20 miles north of Gaza. That's 35 miles west of Jerusalem. My point is this. Philip couldn't just stay in one place. He was actually preaching the gospel all the way up the coast until he went home. Home, which we find out 20 years later, he's still ministering in his community in Acts 21.8 in Caesarea. He is being hospitable to the disciples in his own home. Now, I leave you all with this. As Jeremy turns out the lights, he didn't know that I was doing this. But I want to make a very clear point to you all. It's not as dark as I thought it'd be. <laughs> but here's the thing. We live in a very dark, broken, messed up, cold world. And we live in this dark, messed up, broken, cold world because of sin. And people are searching just like the eunuch for their hearts, for their souls to be satisfied. And it is our privilege, it is our duty, it is our honor to be the ambassadors for Jesus Christ, to be the misfits that we were wired to be. That we get to engage in the story. We get to tell. People want us to tell them about Jesus. People need to see that we are living for Jesus. So folks, here is my encouragement. Here is my challenge to you this week. Of Okay, what's next? What am I going to do after this sermon? Here's two things. Number one. Maybe take a flashlight, put it in your car, put it somewhere you're going to see on a regular basis to remind you that you are the light, that we are supposed to be sharing our faith of Jesus Christ. That he is the hope, that he is alive. That is why we live and breathe. And two, very simple. Tell someone about Jesus. And after service, there are little postcards there are, there's postcards here, there's postcards here, there's postcards in the back. Why don't you take one and give it to someone that you know to invite them back next week so they can hear about Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and not who we are, but for who you are. That we get to come in your very midst. We get to come in your presence because of Jesus Christ. The blood, the atonement, the Lamb of God. Father, thank you for the Spirit of God that rises up in us. That conquered hell. That defeated death. And that we have a relationship with the eternal God of the universe. Father, our prayer is that this week. That we would not be boxed in. 
That, Father, that we would boldly share our faith, rather at work, outside of work, in the neighborhood, with our family, with our kids, with people we don't necessarily like, but, Lord, that you have called us to love. And, Lord God, our prayer is that we would be intimately in love with you, that we would search, that we would dig, that we would spend intimate time with you. And the more time that we spend with you, the more that we find of how amazing you are. There's a dying world that needs to know that you reign. There's a world out here, Lord, in our own backyard that people need to repent and come to the cross and to hear the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we glorify you. All in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,